Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. We are your hosts. My name is Gabrielle Ha Cohen, and I am here with my BFF. Oh, IFB cult survivor Sadie Carpenter. How are you doing, Sadie? Uh, I am doing fantastic. Uh, we have been receiving messages and Facebook posts and everything about the show that dropped on Netflix last month, Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey. And we got so many messages and Facebook posts about this that we bumped an episode, we kicked a can down the road so that we could talk about this now. Yeah, this is like, I mean, this is a topic that I think we've had this on the list for the for a while. Yeah, we the have. general idea of talking about the FLDS was on our list, um, but I watched the Netflix show um, and was just entranced by it. And then everybody was like, hey, do you want to talk about this? And I was like, oh, actually, yes, I do. <laughs> Yeah, we like because this is uh, this is something that's really interesting. You know what I saw from, and and we're going to talk about this more later. Um, I see many, many, many similarities, especially with uh, when we talked about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians uh, back in January. That was uh, I, I see a lot of similarities there. But yeah, we're talking about the FLDS, the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter Day Saints, um, yes. and th- this is really exciting. I do want to mention, we are talking about FLDS, different from LDS, different from the regular Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. <laughs> yes, that's not the term the, they prefer, the regular church. <laughs> not the same thing. Um, we do, I think we're planning, we would like to talk about the the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at some point, but there's a couple of things that we have to do um, before that, which is I like I, we want to get deeper into their doctrines and like really examine what it is they believe. And also because they are a like whether however you feel about what they believe and or, or not, they are a, a mainstream religion. And so it would be weird if we had a whole episode where we talked about a mainstream religion and we didn't have a member or former member on the show to really you know, make sure that we're not misrepresenting their beliefs. Right. I'll talk Um, about the IFB all day long because I was raised in it and I'm qualified to let you know what I think is common to most or all IFB churches and what I think might have just been my church or my specific group of churches. I'm not qualified to make that distinction for the LDS because I was never immersed in it. So if we're going to dig into it, and especially if we're going to be trying to make any kind of of judgment call on whether it's a cult or not, I don't want to do that without somebody who can be that qualified person. FLDS, on the other hand, absolutely (laughs) a cult, 1000%. Well, and I think on that same note, I think I'm qualified to make that call because... While I was never a part of the FLDS, never involved with it, never immersed in it, I experienced so many of the same types of coercive control that the FLDS did to its members that I can identify with those methods of control and the experience of being controlled in that way. Yeah, and the the stories of abuse are just so well documented. That, yeah, and 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 tragic. Anyway. Oh, we should we should say um, this episode is going to have mentions of child sexual assault and um, child marriage, child brides. There is only one point in the episode where we're going to be talking about that in any kind of graphic detail. I will let you know beforehand. It's right at the end of the episode, but I'll let you know before I say anything. Yeah. Um. But. We're going to just get right into this. But before we do that, I just need to say that the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist cult. We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults, including uh, but not limited to the Quiverful movement. Um, and as uh, we're talking about the, today, the the FLDS. We talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism. We talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole. And it is our 
goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought, and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you are a fan of our show, there's a couple of things that you can do. Number one, you can join our Facebook group, hang out with other fans of the show. I think we have 2,000 members in our Facebook group now. Wow. It is called facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. So if you go to that URL, you will find a group full of many wonderful people. You can join our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. You can join our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Leaving Eden Podcast, where we have extended and uncensored versions of most of our episodes. Great bonus content there, including actual cult survivor Sadie Carpenter's opinions on The Handmaid's Tale. Very good read. I would highly recommend it. Uh, Anything else I'm forgetting? Did you talk about our new merch? No, I did not. We have some brand new merchandise that is available. We have a brand new logo. So if you bought our old Leaving Eden podcast merch, uh, that is OG merch. It's extra cool now. But we also have a new Leaving Eden podcast logo. Check it out. It's very cool. You can buy Club Egypt merch if you are a PCC alum. Club Egypt is for you. I'm wearing my Club Egypt hoodie right now. Super fun. Super cool. It's awesome. And I guess that's it. We just have to thank our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons. Hold on. Let me pull up the list of Faith Promise Missions tier patrons. I got to thank our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons. So Faith Promise Missions tier patrons, the people that really make this show possible, that really make it possible for us to create this content that you all enjoy. Your names are Alex Todd, Brittany, Brooke Tolly, Carrie R., Crystal Patterson, Eleanor Donahue, Emery Fairlosser, the OG Emery Fairlosser. Thank you so much. Hannah Ross, Hope Norum, Jen Kacharski, Jessica Tambo, Kay Terwee, Catherine Schneider, Kathleen Moncrief, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lorena Watson, Michaela Upright, Madeline Cusick, Mary Martin, Megan Arndt, Mike Smith, Miranda Day, Rachel Bernadowitz, Rebecca Hoyt, Reverend Robert Stutz, Sadie's actual BFF Morgan, Sarah Reese, Shane Horton, Stephanie Ann Johnson, Taylor, Tiffany Enderby, Victoria McKenzie, and finally, Wes the Cowboy. Thank you so much. That's what C stands for. Wes C. C stands for Cowboy. For cowboy. Um, well, thank you yeah. so much to all of our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons and to all of our patrons. Uh, we appreciate y'all so much. And I am getting extremely hyped about our live show in August. <laughs> yeah, we. That's it's going to be awesome. It's going to be so sick. Anyway, Sadie. Yes. Who are the FLDS? Why are we talking about them? Because the people demanded it is why we're talking about them. Yeah, okay. (laughs) But also because I find this story incredibly fascinating. And I think that there are a lot of valuable insights that I can make comparing the FLDS experience to my cult experience. Was that a better answer? (laughs) That's a great answer. No, I, I this is this is really exciting. Um, I think it's it, good that we're getting like the crazies out of the way first, so that when we go back and we talk about LDS, we can talk about really more of the mainstream thing. We don't have to really address the 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 real crazies. Um, but so, yeah. So the the FLDS is the fundamentalist Church of Christ Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. From what I've been able to tell, if I can kind of contextualize this. For listeners of this show, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is probably about as broad in theology and practice as Baptists. So with the Baptists, you have the Southern Baptist Convention, which is kind of the big one. You have other large Baptist conventions as well. And then you have independent Baptists who aren't connected to any of those large conventions or denominations. But a lot of a lot of independent Baptists would be involved with a particular movement, 
one of those movements is the IFB movement, the Independent Fundamental Baptist movement. So while independent Baptists don't have a denominational head or denominational oversight or denominational money, they follow a lot of the same particulars depending on what movement they're in. So if they're in the IFB movement, they're loosely affiliated in a non-governmental way with tons of other IFB churches who also practice King James onlyism, dress standards, music standards, the type of services that they have. But there are outliers, even in independent Baptists. I have heard of independent Baptist churches that are progressive and LGBT affirming and ordain women. Obviously, those are not a part of the IFB movement. Yeah, but they're also unaffiliated. So independent would be technically the correct way to denote them. Right. Just they are an independent Christian church that practices Baptist theology and is not fundamentalist. It's the fundamental part, the F in the IFB, that tends to designate churches as part of the IFB movement, which is what I grew up in. It's, you know, the the King James and all of that stuff. So they would be IB. You know, if they had mm-hmm. a seminary, it, they would you would go to the IBS <laughs> um, which is the same place that I go to when I drink uh, milk. So. I, I was, I was going to, yeah, I was going to make a joke about, isn't that a Jewish seminary? <laughs> <laughs> the IBS, yeah. IBS is a, is a sub school at uh, Yeshiva University. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the F in IFB has a denotation and it has a very strong connotation as well. So the denotation, the literal meaning, is that they hold to the fundamentals of the Christian faith, whatever they determine the the fundamentals to be. And they are very strict and very particular about their adherence to the fundamentals. What the fundamentals are can fluctuate a little bit church to church, but for example, the IFB movement as a whole kind of has a standardized list. We'll do a whole episode on that when I can figure out how not to make it boring. (laughs) But the connotation is what makes more of a difference. The connotation is very powerful because the connotation is that churches adhere to similar dress standards, similar music standards, and styles of preaching and beliefs on all sorts of things that are not included in the fundamentals. So the the connotation almost says more about the church than the denotation does. So the F and FLDS has the same sort of wait connotation or denotation. Denotation. And I, okay. In IF. Okay. It's the it's the same literal meaning that they adhere to what they determine to be the fundamental doctrines of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. The connotation, however, is different. So the connotation for IFB is that they have all these dress standards and scripture t- translation standards. It's uh, don't go to movies, don't drink alcohol, all that kind of thing. The connotation for the FLDS is focused on the practice of plural marriage, polygamy. That's the fundamental that adds the F in FLDS that makes them different. That one thing. Yeah, there are, there are really minor side issues like... The way that people dress and, and other behavior rules, but the plural marriage is the big thing. So, because there are only so many ways to exert cult like control over people, a lot of the methods of control are going to be very similar to the methods of control that I experienced in the IFB. So, we're going to dig into both the plural marriage, like how the FLDS split off from the LDS. But we're also going to look at some of the methods of control that that they share in common with the IFB. So they're not under the umbrella of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints anymore. They're, no, they're, they're not. something they've split off from that. They're completely different, right? So they're okay. not under the leadership of the LDS because they split off in the early 1900s because the FLDS leaders at the time believed that the LDS leaders were straying away from the fundamentals of the faith, a.k.a. the practice of plural marriage. Mm, that, that's the fundamental. That is, yeah, that is the, the one fundamental 
that the FLDS believes is essential and the LDS does not believe is essential. Okay. And I want to note that the LDS has had many, many splits and splinter groups. This is just one of them. This is typical of new religions, to have an original group and then to have tons of splinter groups pop up in the first few centuries. It happened to mainstream Christianity. <laughs> um, if you study early church history, it's wild. So this is this is not unusual for a newer religion. Do you want to give us a rundown of the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints before the FLDS split off? Absolutely. I okay, would and love then I'll to. take it from the split and kind of explain how that went. Okay. Great. So Second Great Awakening, 1830s. Joseph Smith uh, has a church in upstate New York. He is, he is a pastor of a church in upstate New York. He is attracting members because he says that he has a New Testament from Jesus Christ, which he found because he got a vision from God telling him to dig under a tree, dug under the tree, found some golden plates. What do you know? New Testament from Jesus Christ. So he wants to create a new Jerusalem or a Zion in North America. And he believes that that is Jackson County, Missouri, that that's the place to do it. Unfortunately for Smith and his followers, the people living in Jackson County aren't too fond of him and his church and their ideas and their doctrines, namely the idea that men can become gods after they die and also his church's support for plural marriage, also known as polygamy. So there's a lot of violence against these people, against uh, Smith and his followers. And in 1844, Smith and his designated successor, uh, his brother Hiram, um, so Joseph and Hiram Smith, uh, uh, two leaders within this group, they're killed by an angry mob of, uh, of people uh, and the leadership of the church falls to Brigham Young, who decides, you know, he's had enough of people really acting out violence against them. Uh, it's no fun. It's not good. So he takes the church and decides to move them out west to the frontier territory that is now known as Utah, figuring that if they were out west, that nobody would really care what they were getting up to and that they could practice polygamy in peace. Unfortunately, this is not the case. And the U.S. government puts a lot of effort into trying to ban new plural marriages, putting pressure on the church to allow the practice to cease, you know, th that sort of thing. And it, I think they went so far as to officially disincorporate the church. And so as a result of a lot of this pressure, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints stopped doing plural marriages by the end of the 19th century. So that's kind of a thing. You all hear about the Mormons doing um, polygamy, but the, I, really they haven't done that for more than 100 years. So I appreciate the history. That was just as good as if we had played all-American Prophet from the Book of Mormon musical, uh, and it is now stuck in my head just as much as if we had played that song. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm sure there are others out there. The big takeaway here, I think, that pertains to the FLDS is that the LDS is founded on people claiming, well, men, claiming that they hear directly from God. So for scripture, the LDS had the original New Testament of Jesus, the, the part three to the Bible that Joseph Smith allegedly found buried because God told him where to look for it. And as time went on, Smith and other leaders would continue to claim to have revelations from God about how to practice this new religion. This is still an existing mainstream Mormon doctrine that the president of the church, whoever the current president, leader, prophet is, can speak directly to God and hear directly from God in a much more verbal sense than is practiced by other denominations of or other types of Christianity or however you want to phrase that. So you mentioned that the LDS moved away from plural marriage at the end of the 19th century. What's really interesting about that to me is that Utah was having trouble joining the union because the union didn't want them unless they took care of this plural marriage issue that they had going on because that conflicted with anti-bigamy laws in the United States. And conveniently, 
That's when LDS President Wilford Woodruff had a revelation from God in 1890 that they were not supposed to do plural marriage anymore, which I think is just very convenient timing for him to have a revelation from God. Well, I see how this is very convenient timing, but I also don't see how this is any different from the Apostle Paul saying, you don't have to follow any of the dietary laws if you don't want to, because he's desperate for new members of his church. Ooh. Um, <laughs> And I mean, the Romans love them some salami. So like, I mean, that like that's that's a fair point. I, I don't know. I think that maybe uh, w- with this uh, this no polygamy doctrine coming in this this revelation, maybe God realized that America wasn't ready for that yet, because like Abraham argued with God and convinced him to change his mind. So who's to say that Woodruff wouldn't go to God and say, OK, so I know you said polygamy cool thing we should do but it's getting to be a huge problem for us people are being mean to us it's 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 getting to be a huge problem and on the scale of things that are important to you what's more important polygamy or us not ceasing to exist we got to choose these two things are mutually exclusive that seems to be the take from the mainstream lds at the time but this is this is where some major split-offs occur. Fundamentalist Mormons claimed to have found a revelation from 1886, four years before Woodruff's manifesto from 1890, from the president who was president in 1886, John Taylor. So according to the doctrine, in 1890, uh, Woodruff can speak to God. But in 1886... John Taylor could speak to God. And what God said to John Taylor in 1886 was, well, it wasn't just God. John Taylor and Joseph Smith personally showed up to talk to John Taylor in 1886. And they said that plural marriage should always be a part of the LDS church. So this is something that they have determined it is worth splitting over. Yes. So the split occurred along these lines of competing revelations from God. So which revelation did people believe? Because the whole vi- the whole religion is based on visions and revelations from God. If this guy's vision and that guy's vision conflict, it's definitely going to be something worth splitting over. Because God could only have said one of those two things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So fundamentalist Mormon dissenters who continued to solemnize new plural marriages were eventually, after like warnings and paperwork and things, excommunicated by the LDS. So over the next roughly 100 years, the fundamentalist LDS would splinter several more times. All of these splinter groups did believe in plural marriage polygamy as a fundamental concept of the LDS church. So these further splits were more over who was going to be the prophet because they're the, the one man, the leader who can talk to God. There's a belief about the priesthood be what the priesthood is a position within the church and a position in relation to God. And it's passed from one man to another All LDS men are supposed to strive to be a member of the priesthood, this position. We'll have to get into that more when we discuss the mainstream LDS church, because there's a lot of nuance to that. But there always have to be initiated men who are in the priesthood, who can pass the priesthood on to others. Uh, Like in Christianity, there always have to be people who are baptized who can then baptize more people. Like continue yeah, oh, passing. Okay. So the idea is like, like our deacon at our church who mm-hmm. baptized Chuck was baptized by somebody who was baptized by somebody, and it goes all the way back to the apostles. It's the apostolic line of baptism. This is the same idea. Like the priesthood has to be passed from person to person to person until it gets all the way back to Joseph Smith. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that is interesting, huh? But the position of prophet, the one guy at the very top who talks to God personally. It's also passed from just one person at a time to one other person. So one guy has it, he dies, it passes to the next person. That guy dies, he passes it to the next guy. 
So in the FLDS, without the structure of leadership in the LDS, if one prophet died and then two more guys were both like, hey, God told me I'm the next prophet, there's a power struggle. And that could potentially lead to another split. So this is sort of like how we talked about in... Uh, when we were talking about David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, that, that like there is always going to be a prophet. Yeah, exactly like yeah. that. Okay. The more I learn, the more I think that all cults are using the same playbook. Even when Jack Scott was taking over leadership of First Baptist Church of Hammond, there was this same kind of power struggle, even though they don't have the concept of him being a prophet or a direct lineage of leaders with some kind of special power. So okay, so this pro, so the prophet thing, that that is that is true for the whole of the LDS, and it's just that the FLDS think that so, that it was somebody else back in like 1890, and then it came, and then then the lines split, and and went yes, from there. Okay. so the lines split, and the FLDS is like, no, our guys have always been the prophet, and then the LDS is like. No, our guys have always been the prophet. The current president of the LDS Church, if you were curious, it's Russell M. Nelson. And so he is the guy who I guess is currently the prophet if you are LDS. According to the LDS, according to the FLDS, it's extremely messy who is the prophet right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. We'll get to it. that. <laughs> yeah. Mm, no. So uh, how, how do they choose, though? I mean, like, I, I just don't understand how, that people can choose who God is going to talk to. So we'll get to that when we eventually do our full episode on the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's a whole hierarchy uh, and system for how the prophet is chosen. It's kind of analogous to how the Pope is chosen out of the current set of cardinals, which I'm just now realizing you probably don't know about. Um, (laughs) I know that there's like an election or something and they have to... The Pope... Almost. Yeah, the, the Pope gets the current group of cardinals when a pope dies all get together and they choose one of their own to be the next pope and it's set up in such a way that it's set up in such a way that catholics believe that the holy spirit chooses the next pope and there's not supposed to be any kind of politicking over it or running for pope but of course there's politicking in it (laughs) that yeah you know there, there there are things about catholicism that i'm really into and there are things that i'm like okay this is kind of um unrealistic i believe in the god part but come on (laughs) y'all so francis seems all right uh generally a fan yeah Mm. so it's it seems to me as far as leading the lds church though the prophet is considered to personally directly speak to God and Jesus and have them speak back. And then the prophet can lead the faithful by telling them what God said to them. That's, I mean, you know, I've, I've got to say it, these L, they're really lucky LDS people, you know, I mean, like, like in biblical Israel, you know, we had Kings who were also prophets, you know, they spoke to God, but we didn't have prophets the whole time. These guys have prophets the whole time. You know, I mean, like we had gaps. They don't have, they don't even have to worry about gaps, uh, gaps. And sometimes we had like more than one prophet at once, you know? It, yeah, but like, y'all don't have to deal with hell anxiety. So really, <laughs> I, I mean, that's true. You do have, a, you got a real sweet deal on that one. That's true. I mean, they do have tears to their heaven. So like, we're going to get to the heaven tears. We're going to get to that. Yeah. So. I mean, it it makes sense when you consider that the entire faith is built on this idea that certain men, one at a time, have direct two-way communication with God. But back to the FLDS. They had split off from the, uh, from the LDS, and they therefore believed that the LDS prophet wasn't valid because he didn't support polygamy. He had strayed away from the faith. So they needed their own prophets to continue that prophetic line. When there was a conflict of prophets that tended... So if there's a conflict of prophets and half of the people think that guy A is the new prophet and the other half of people think that guy B is the new prophet, they're just going to split into group A and group B. If 99% of people are going with guy A and 1% of people are going with guy B, the 1% of people are probably going to be like, eh, fine, we're wrong. This guy A is the prophet. <laughs> so, hmm. but, but when it was split like that, it tended to form two new groups who followed this prophet or that prophet. 
interesting tidbit that I came across. One of these groups that split off the original FLTS group is called the Apostolic United Brethren. So this group is neither LDS nor FLDS. They are fundamentalist Mormons, but not part of the FLDS church. They split off in the 1950s, and that's the group that the Brown family of sister wives is a part of. Christine Brown, Mm. who has now left Cody and polygamy, is the granddaughter of a guy who was a big part of the splintering off from the FLDS in the 50s. That's interesting. Fun that's fact. fascinating. Yeah. So that's how so that's how Christine Brown is uh theologically related to Warren Jeffs. Wow. Huh. Yeah. So I can't help but bring up what you said earlier about how the way th- this is set up very similar to the way that the IFB or, or that that quiverful groups operate. You know, because like the IFB, <clears throat> I mean the IBLP would have a patriarch rather than like a prophet who is in charge. Uh but Either way, the guy that you're following is somebody who is empowered by God with divine good judgment, except for, you know, if you're FLDS, uh, then it's a a guy who can literally commune with God. But Right. And in the IBLP, your patriarch is literally your father, and the headship passes from the father of a family to his sons when they become husbands and fathers. So the passing of power is very direct and there can't be, because it's a a literal direct patriarchy, there can't be any kind of power struggle in that. Also, the Baptist position, just to clarify, uh, Baptists believe in general that some people hear from God more readily because they are spiritually pure. They are closer to God and therefore more attuned to the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is characterized as a still small voice. So if you are busy sinning, you're going to miss the still small voice. But if you're not busy sinning and you're listening to God, you're going to hear the still small voice. But they, Baptists in general, believe that literally anyone who is a Christian can hear from God, can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. So there aren't particular prophets. There are just people who are more pure and godly and therefore hear God's voice louder. Hmm. Baptists also tend to not believe that God verbally speaks to them, like in a audible voice. It's more in strong feelings or strong impressions or signs or the voices in one's head. Uh, so the details are different, but the overall concept has a lot of similarity. Huh. That is interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. So I think this would be a good place to lay out why plural marriage is such a big issue. Other than the issue of conflicting revelations, both claiming to be from God, the reason that this was worth splitting over for the FLDS is because marriage is a huge part of Mormon theology. So I have friends, and I'm sure you do too, who are polyamorous and who will be in relationships with more than one person at the same time. We live in Portland. I feel like that answers your question. Yes. Um, And like, it's not for me. You know, I'm not going to hate. Um, if it works for somebody, it works for somebody. Uh, just make sure that you have that Google Calendar situation just squared away on lock. Polygamy is everywhere in the Bible, right? Like, it's it's all over the place. Like, Jacob, yeah. had, <laughs> Jacob had two wives and two concubines. And the whole of the Jewish people are descended from one man and four women. So, King Solomon... Um, had hundreds of wives. And so, like, I'm not sure why polygamy is such a big deal or why banning it would be such a big deal. So I'm going to have to do a little bit about Mormon teachings about heaven to answer that. I do find this fascinating, so I hope you will, too. Oh, okay. Go for it. So part of the new revelation that Joseph Smith, the all-American prophet, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed voice of God, allegedly dug up from under a tree on a hill in his backyard. Sorry, I (laughs) promised myself I wouldn't do that. Is that from Book of Mormon? Yes, that is from the song All-American Prophet, which may be my favorite song in the musical. It's really good. Um, I haven't seen Book of Mormon. I've heard it's funny. it's It's very funny. I've heard that they are doing a new that they are revamping it to take out some things that they are now realizing are more offensive than they wanted them to be, which I'm well, very interested to find out about. It's Matt and Trey. They've, they've done some really shady stuff. Like they did that. Do you remember the Mr. Garrison's fancy new vagina episode yes. of South Park? 
Yes. That, mm. And as much as I like, as much as I enjoy a lot of what they make very much, there's generally one joke in anything by them that I'm just like, eh. Yeah. I mean, that one, the, the whole point of the episode was you're not a woman if you can't have babies. And which I'm, is no. No, that's no that's not no. the 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 angle. That's that not take the take, you two cis men. Yeah. That's not the take. Um, but I, I really, Book of Mormon is an incredibly offensive musical. But to go back to Mormon marriage, the belief is that a wife can only have one husband in this celestial kingdom but the husband can have as many wives as he wants. This has to do with the whole woman having to be brought into heaven by a man thing. We'll have to come back to that. Mm. In early teachings before the 1890 manifesto, plural marriage was actually encouraged because part of that celestial kingdom is being able to make celestial babies with these celestial wives, thereby populating the universe with pure, perfect souls. So, the FLDS belief, which was in the original teachings of the church, was that having multiple wives and making a bunch of babies here on earth was necessary to get into the VIP area in heaven, where you can chill with all those wives and continue to make celestial babies. Later, um, the FLDS in particular set the standard for the celestial kingdom at three wives or more. So the FLDS thought that by banning plural marriage, the church was taking away the track to get to the good part of heaven. Does that make sense now why it was such a big deal? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, Because it's not just like a feature of the religion. It's a major part of church doctrine. Like this is your ticket to the afterlife. Right. It's very different from like the Catholic uh, conception of marriage as a sacrament. In Catholicism, marriage is one of seven sacraments. It's one of seven formal ways that you receive God's grace, but it's far from a requirement to attain heaven. The grace of God gets you to heaven. Marriage is just one of the seven big ways that you get some of that grace. The teachings about marriage and heaven being so intertwined, as far as I know, it's unique to the LDS. So I want you to hold on to That concept of having at least three wives is a qualification for getting to the celestial kingdom, though, because that's going to come back here in a few minutes. So FLDS believe not only is the regular LDS church preventing a sacred piece of their doctrine from being implemented, but they also believe that they are essentially keeping all of their members out of heaven's VIP VIP club where you get to be literally a god. Right. So FLDS members tended to live together in settlements. If we're talking about the early days after the split off from the LDS, this was often in undeveloped Wild West United States. But the FL the, FL, the FLDS continued to live in communities even as the West became more developed. So often entire cities would all or mostly be part of the FLDS. They did interact with the outside world. So they would have these cities that were 5,000 or 10,000 people in a town and 90 to 100 percent of them would all be part of the FLDS. But the people who lived in that city would own companies with that interacted with the outside world and did business with the world, like construction companies, factories, farms, that kind of thing. Yeah. I, I mean, that makes sense. But I can also see where that could like be a potential problem, where if your entire community is all in with the one leader and that leader ends up being abusive or bad and you need to leave, that's your whole support system that's gone. And furthermore, they can also like, if they've got, you know, the the town, they've got the police, they've got everybody, they can physically prevent you from leaving much more easily than they could if they were just like a normal town. Yeah, you're getting a a really good handle on the many problems that are very bad in this situation. So Rulon Jeffs. Was a pro- was the prophet who took leadership of the FLDS in 1986, and this is when those problems get real bad, and they only get worse. The main community where Jeffs and his massive family lived 
was in Short Creek, Arizona. It was right on the Arizona-Utah border. So technically, there's a Short Creek, Arizona and a Short Creek, Utah. And it's the same town because the town is on the border. But there were other communities across the West, even in Canada, that were FLDS and recognized Rulon Jeffs as their leader and prophet. So why don't we take up the offering now and we can come back and dive into the direction that Rulon Jeffs took the FLDS. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Let's do it. Cool. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, That group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. All right, we are back from our break. In the first half, we talked about the origins of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints split off from the main church and becoming its own separate entity. And we introduced, who do we introduce? Rulon Jeffs. Rulon Jeffs, yeah. The the minor villain of this story. Minor father of villain. the major villain of this story. And Oy father vey. of some other minor villains of this story as well. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, take me through him. Who's this guy? When does he take charge? So Rulon Jeffs took charge as prophet of the FLDS in 1986 And he immediately took the FLDS in a new, stricter direction. Under Rulon's leadership, the rules for FLDS life intensified. So Rulon is the one who instituted FLDS women wearing very little house on the prairie type clothing and hairstyles. He cracked down on pretty much every part of the bite model. He also outlawed wearing red or driving red cars because that was Mm -hmm. heresy because Jesus was going to come back in a red robe. So you're wearing Jesus's colors, so don't do that. Uh, Plural marriage and marriage of underage girls were very much parts of FLDS practice before Rulon just took leadership, but he stepped up both of those things to disastrous outcomes. Rulon Jeffs took the part of FLDS doctrine about plural marriage very seriously, and he instituted the idea that everyone should have, every man should have at least three wives. He also took his role as the prophet very seriously. So Rulon Jeffs would keep an eye on all the young women in the community, and he would decide when they were old enough to get married, and then he would assign them either to a man in leadership or to himself. So he Mm. would just call young women into his office or they would be brought into his office by their parents. And he would just inform this young woman that she was ready to get married and that she would be becoming the fourth wife of one of his higher ups, a powerful man in the FLDS. Or he would inform her that he had chosen her to be one of the wives of the prophet and that she would be marrying him. So how old would these women be that he was marrying off? In the documentary, Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey, we hear from women who were married to Jeff's very young. Rulon had somewhere around 65 wives at the time of his death. One of the people we hear from in the documentary is Rebecca Wall, who was 19 when she was married to Rulon. He was 85 at the time. Ew. Yeah. It seems that the youngest quote-unquote wife that he took was around 14. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rulon started a lot of things that his son then took further, which we'll talk about here shortly. For example, uh, Rulon had the pictures of each of his wives displayed at his house in order of when they were married to him. And then he would have all his wives line up in like order of seniority to kiss him goodnight every night, which is gross. That is weird. And then he would just pick That's- one of them out of the line and be like, you're staying with me tonight. Ugh. 
Uh, we talk a lot about purity culture in the IFB. And I think we've we've kind of gone into quite a bit of detail about how a person could potentially get to their wedding knowing very little about sex. That was absolutely happening in the FLDS to an even greater extent, possibly. So Rulon Jeffs would... There's scare quotes around every time I say marry because it's not marriage, because there's not consent. Um, but he would marry a child as young as 14 and then rape her in the marriage bed, basically saying, this is what God wills for you. You have to surrender to God's will. So the levels of coercion here are chilling, truly disturbing. Yeah. This was one of the things... Oh. I felt was most relatable from a, from an IFB perspective, though, about the documentary. Rebecca Wall talks about her first time being raped by Rulon Jeffs on their wedding night and not knowing what was happening to her. She didn't know what sex was, so she had no way of knowing if what this man was doing to her was what he was supposed to be doing or not. So she couldn't figure out... Is he doing what a husband does to a wife, or is he doing something else, something sinful? Because this seems sinful to me. There was another story from a woman who was married to a man in leadership. And this was the first time, not the last, that my heart broke in a million pieces watching this documentary. This woman was married off to a man in leadership at a young age. Same kind of scenario, did not know what was going on. Um, she went to Rulon, and she made this excruciating, humiliating confession of what her husband was doing to her. She didn't have any kind of proper terms for her own body parts or his body parts. She had no language to try to convey what he was doing, but she described it as best as she could. And she said, I think my husband is doing some kind of sin to me because this doesn't seem right. And she was laughed off. She was, <laughs> she was told Wow. No, that's what sex is. And if you don't like it, you have an unsubmissive spirit. That's hard. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, like that's and one of the things. Like, does this make about. sense though? Like how yeah. this is a almost a logical extent of the IFB purity culture teachings. Yeah, this is like taking it to the extreme, extreme. No, yeah, the like, IFB is like, already what, extreme, yeah. and this is then a, a greater extreme. Like because uh, they don't know what sex is, how sex works. And then if you don't tell somebody what these things are, they won't know that they're being abused. They won't know that they're being raped or molested. And it's e like, even if, you know, they're not married off at 12, 13, 14 years old, if they're just being molested by somebody in their church when they're a teenager, you know, it's easier to blame them for doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And like, I mean, we've heard stories from listeners who were abused as children and, they didn't learn what sex was until right before they got married, you know, the three months before you get married or whatever. And then they realized with shock and horror and trauma that this is what had been being done to them against their own will. And this is like, this is why it's so important that you have to have age appropriate sex education and that nobody should be exempt from it, regardless of what your religious objection is to it. Because, you know, it's it's for the child's own protection and keeping this information away from the kids isn't going to protect them. It's going to, it's not going to keep them innocent or whatever. It's going to protect abusers and it's going to protect pedophiles and it's going to keep people who are real predators from being held accountable. Exactly. And this is why it's so rage inducing to hear sex ed categorized as grooming because preventing kids from having Basic information about their own bodies is ideal for anyone who does want to actually groom them. There's a story that I can't get out of my head. And trigger warning, this is a story about child sexual assault. It's really brief, but I think it's important. I read this story and I've read, I read this probably years ago for the first time. There's a story about a teacher whose student kept telling her over a matter of months, the student kept coming to her to complain and say, my uncle licked my cookie. And the teacher assumed that this kid was being literal. The kid, the teacher thought, oh, the kid is mad because the uncle is playing around and licking her chocolate chip cookie that she wanted to eat. And now it's gross. You know, oh, no. the teacher took it literally 
But it turned out that cookie was the euphemism that the child had been taught to use for her genitals. And the child was trying to report sexual assault, but could not get her message through because she did not have the vocabulary. And if the child had had a proper way of communicating about her own body and what was happening to her, it could have saved the child from additional months of abuse. Oh, no. Yeah. Mm. Well, I mean, you, you know what it is? They like, I think it was Joseph Goebbels who said this was that whatever it is that you're doing, accuse your enemy of doing that thing, you know? Yep. So uh, like all the people who are saying, you know, teaching kids sex ed is gr- like, they're the ones who are actually being abusive. Like that's, you know, that I don't know. I like, I was reading about this and I saw like the parallels that I saw between this man, Rulon Jeffs and David Koresh and, and his son, Warren Jeffs uh, and David Koresh. I mean, the, these parallels are really apparent. Um, I mean, it was pretty much the exact same thing that David Koresh was doing with the women at Mount Carmel, except for that. I like, I guess was Je- was Jeffs telling the women was Jeffs telling the married people that their marriages were no longer valid. Like, could he just say your wife is mine now? I don't have any record of Rulon Jeffs doing that, uh, but Warren 100% did. He would punish men. Yeah, he punished men by reassigning their wives and children to other men. That's. Yeah, we're going to we're going to talk about some of the ramifications of that down the way. No. So, okay. so here's a question. If Rulon and Warren Jeffs, they're marrying all of these women when they turn 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, whatever. Um. What happens to all the boys who are coming up and they're getting to that age? Like, it, it, what what do you do if you're 17, 18, 19, 20, 21? You're a young man. There's no available women. I was wondering that as, as well. I think that there are quite a few factors here. It's not addressed in the documentary because the documentary very rightfully focused on the experience of women in this group. But I I was able to gather a couple different pieces of information that made this make more sense. So, number one, uh, the prophet, Rulon Jeffs or Warren Jeffs later, wasn't marrying every eligible girl. Some of them he was assigning to be third and fourth and fifth wives of men in leadership. Uh, But some of them he was assigning to be first wives. Uh, There are stories in the documentary about wives being assigned to younger men in the group. So I think what it was was Jeffs and his higher ups were getting the first pick. And then eventually, if younger men stuck around and were loyal, they would be assigned, um, I want to say a starter wife. I don't know if that's disrespectful. Or somebody who is maybe seen as less desirable for whatever reason. That's or, that's one potential mm-hmm. thing. And then another thing that I've read is that... um. We're going to talk about young men getting kicked out to increase the available supply of young women, uh, but also a lot of young men left because mm. they were they were under the impression of, of exactly that. I'm never going to get a wife or I'm never going to be able to choose my own wife. This isn't worth it to me. Yeah. So, like, I mean, it's just like, how, how does if you stay in it, how, how does this whole thing work? Is it just like a you follow me, you do X thing for me? You know, you help me enforce my law. Uh, you stay loyal to me and you will get sexual access to teenage girls. Is is that like that's the impression that I get? Um, I don't mm. I don't want to mischaracterize because on at this point when we're talking about Rulon Jeff's administration, if you will. So pre 2000. The teenage girls that were getting married off were 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, I am not saying that that is okay. In that culture, 16-year-olds were seen more as adults. Once again, does not make it okay. Uh, Does not mean that they are able to consent to uh, a marriage or to sexual activity with an older man. But it was... There is a line for me uh, between someone who is seen as a very young adult in your community and someone who is not, which we're going to get to. 
So what okay. I'm what I'm saying is what Rulon was doing was one level of bad and evil. What Warren went on to do was a completely different level of bad and evil. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Maybe the, the Jeffs in their last name is short for Jeffrey Epstein. This Ugh. is super f- No, but like, I because I, I was thinking about because, you know, you're saying they're kicking the boys out. Like if you're just a regular teenage boy and your father isn't in leadership or whatever, uh, like you don't like you're not really going to have any way of working yourself up, are you? So you, like so, you know, the, the pretty girl who, you know, from church is definitely going to be married off to some guy like some old guy when she's 15 or 16, 17. And you're just going to be up sh- creek. You don't really have a hope. So you're just going to be feeling I guess almost like disposable. Yeah, I so. and from from what I have read so far, it seems like young men either doubled down, became really loyal and were like I'm going to work as long as I have to to prove myself to leadership and get wives, or they just said, "You know what? F- this I'm out." Yeah. If they make a part there's been talk of a part 2 of Keep Sweet Pray and Obey. I would love to hear a little bit more about the experiences of young men in the group. I know there is also a documentary called Lost Boys about boys who grew up in the group. And that's the next thing I'm going to watch. Like, I, I wonder. Yeah, I mean, they, they're, they're basically culling them. Uh, it's like a cull of young men. So so how do they do? Are, are they just deciding to leave or are they getting like found guilty of immorality and getting excommunity yeah, or ex- excommunicated or. Are they just like sent off on like a mission to start a new colony somewhere? I don't, like, I, I guess, yeah, it, it makes sense though. If you're a 60 year old man, you can't exactly have a bunch of 20 to 25 year old unmarried men around as competition because that could cause some serious problems, couldn't it? Yeah, I don't think they would have ever been seen as competition. <laughs> Uh, directly because the control that Rulon Jeffs and Warren Jeffs both had during their time as prophet was a lot closer to complete control than anything the IFB ever had. Women simply did not have a choice at all in when they married or who they married. So it wouldn't matter if the 15-year-old that the prophet wanted to marry or that one of his top guys wanted to marry had a crush on an age-appropriate young man in the group. It just wouldn't matter because... <laughs> She's been told to suppress any feelings of crushes or attraction that she has because that's a sin. And even if she does have a crush, it's going to have no bearing at all on who she gets assigned to to marry. I did find some articles that said, uh, you're right, young men were excommunicated and often very literally dumped on the side of the highway somewhere between Utah and Texas over any tiny infraction, like one 14-year-old boy got excommunicated for wearing short sleeves and having a girlfriend, and his family was prohibited mm. from speaking to him or acknowledging that he ever existed. Wow. Yeah. Question. Yes. Are the FLDS about guns? Are they about that life? <clears throat> not like the Branch Davidians were. Not like that. Security forces on the FLDS compounds had weapons I'm not seeing anything that the regular members were hoarding weapons or highly encouraged to own them or anything like that. Okay, see, that makes sense. Because this is like incel breeding ground to the max. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and you, like, you imagine just having like 50 incels hanging around and. Every time they've got a crush on a girl, she gets married to off to Jeff's or like one of you know, your dad's friends or something. Or you your know? dad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And now and you have to call her mom. Yeah. Oh, Because they do that. They that That's something that came up a lot in the FLDS documentary. You had to call all of your dad's wife's mom. That's very weird. But then you're like 30 and you're a virgin and you're not going to be allowed to get married to anyone because you, like, you don't have that kind of status. You don't have that kind of clout. If you've got access to guns, at some point, there's going to just be like, oh, this guy, this church, this whole system, the fact that he's a prophet, he's got to go kind of mentality. And, you know, I mean, there might be like a revolt there. So it would make sense if they're like, "Mm, maybe guns, not the best idea. Maybe we we should have like 
armed security guards around at all times. I can I can see why you would think that that would happen. I don't think that it would, though, because the fear of hell is so deeply ingrained into these people that even if they're mad at the prophet for not giving them a wife, they they still, I think, would be afraid to hurt him because of the fear of hell. Uh, I mean, Sadie, I, we have seen throughout history that young man's horniness absolutely trumps fear of hell in many occasions. So, okay, but the other thing is um, a lot of people who do commit mass shootings are influenced by the internet, and these people don't have the internet. That's true. Yeah. So there are factors that I there are factors I think that make it less likely than you think. Anyway, I want to turn back to the chronology of this and talk about Warren Jeff's takeover. So Rulon Jeffs ramped up the polygamy. He took larger numbers of wives than previous leaders. He ramped up the teachings about obeying the prophet. He ramped up the dress code and the behavior codes and that sort of thing. When Rulon died in 2002, Warren wrested control of the position of prophet. He had older brothers who would have been more likely to be the next prophet, but Warren had just enough support on his side to take that control. With the help of one of his father's wives, Naomi, who said she had a prophetic vision that he was supposed to be the next prophet. After claiming that he was... Mm. So this part is fun. Uh, Warren Jeffs then claimed that he was God and also a reincarnation of his father, who was also God. But wait, if he was a reincarnation of his father, weren't they alive at the same time? Yeah. He said that his father's spirit left his body and then entered Warren's body. Ew. And that he was also God. Um, I feel like you're overlooking the crazy, the uh, wilder part. So- I mean, people have been claiming that they're God and religion like for thousands and thousands of years. That's no big deal. People do that all the time. Uh, well, Warren this- immediately um, then commanded that all of his father's wives marry him because he Wait. was his father who was also God. And all but two of them did. What? Yeah, Rulon's wives all became Warren's wives over the next week, except for two. One of those wives refused to marry him and was forbidden from ever marrying again. And then the other one was Rebecca Wall, who fled and got out at that time. What what in Targaryen is going on here? So if you're wondering if one of those wives who married Warren was his mother... I am. That is what, like, 100% what I am wondering. I am also wondering and still wondering at the time of this recording. Warren's mother uh, was named Marilyn Steed, and there's very little information available about her. And I just was not able to find if she, you know, just ceremonially married him kind of in name only or if she was... The, just remained the mm-hmm. widow of the prophet. It is nobody wants to tell me <laughs> on the internet, so I don't know. Okay, so I'm trying to wrap my head. This is a situation in which your brother can become your stepdad. Uh, yes, yes. That, mm. and oh. your child, your child can become your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law. Am, am I getting this right? That... Hmm. Hey, hold on a second. I'm trying to do Targaryen math right here. No, because... No, what this is... So your The situation here is you are a guy, your mother and was one of like 20-something sister wives. Your half-brother by another one of the sister wives married your mother i don't think that makes your kid your brother or sister-in-law i think that makes your kid it doesn't change your relationship to your kid it changes your relationship to your brother-in-law's kid who married your mother the thing is that your child could absolutely become your brother-in-law or sister-in-law in other ways in this very complicated relational dynamic Everyone's double cousins with each other, and it's... Everyone is double cousins with everybody. So it seems like, as far as marriages, they tried Mm -hmm. to avoid very close relatives, like siblings, 
half siblings, double cousins, maybe aunt and uncle to niece or nephew getting married. But I don't, it doesn't look like they made any effort at all to prevent cousin marriages or anything further apart than that. I don't think they cared. But women were frequently married to the same man that their sister was already married to. So there are lots of sets of sisters that then became sister wives, which, if I'm not mistaken, would make their kids both half siblings and double cousins. And regular cousins. Yeah, well, and regular. You can't be a double cousin without being a regular cousin. Because a double hmm. a double cousin is like, like if two sisters marry two brothers, their kids are cousins through the brothers and also cousins through the sisters that so they're double cousins. I know normal people who have done this. <laughs> I knew a set of sisters who married twin brothers, which is not necessarily abnormal. They were nice people. I don't think there was anything weird <laughs> going on. Uh, okay. I, what, okay, but their kids so are if, all double cousins. Hmm. So if you look back at the book of Genesis, um, Sarah was Abraham's half sister. Jacob and Rachel were cousins and Rachel and Leah were sisters. So Jacob married two of his own cousins, right? Yes. Yeah. I think they were. Or second cousins. Were they cousins? or Wait, Laban, who is the father, is Sarah's brother, right? I think so. Or is he her half? I don't know. No, I'm Laban, to... Laban is Sarah's brother because Jacob was supposed to go work for his uncle. And if Laban is his uncle, then Rachel and Leah are both his first cousins. No, except for that Sarah is Jacob's grandmother. So they'd be second or, or first cousins once removed. Oh, right, because of Isaac. So they are. Yeah. You're right. First cousins I'm, once removed. This, okay. But a- anyway. Rachel and Leah were both sisters, and then Jacob married both of them, and then both of their handmaidens were also his concubines. And the entire, like I said earlier, the entirety of the Jewish people are descended from one man and four women. So in the early days, you're going to end up with a lot of cousin marriages, double cousins, that sort of thing, which I assume is why there are very strong anti-incest laws in the Torah. Right, because the way this was always explained to me is that the gene pool at the time was a lot more pure because it was only a few generations removed from Adam and Eve, who were perfect Mm -hmm. creations of God. So it didn't matter as much if people married close family members, and then by the time the Torah was written, it was more of a big deal, so God put it into law. There was, and possibly still is, by the way, a eugenics component for the FLDS, especially after Warren took power, which we're about to get to more of more of what happened when he took power so apparently warren jeffs had and probably still has a certain select group of about 15 men that were made to impregnate selected women in an incredibly creepy breeding program called the united order even if the women in question Mm -hmm. were already married to other men so that warren jeffs could build up what he thought was a master race of perfect children But as you'll find out as we finish up this story, Warren Jeffs is just a sick, sick man. So this is only the beginning of his horrors. (laughs) This is in the this is in the 2000s. Yeah, Warren took yeah he took over as prophet in 2002. Although he had been running things behind the scenes for a couple years at that point because Rulon's health was failing. So just like Rulon had introduced the stricter modesty standards and dress codes, Warren took it all a step further yet again. Warren was the one who instituted women only being able to wear solid colors and pastels, no patterns, no bright colors. Warren also burned all books except for the Bible. He outlawed toys and most games and anything fun. And I'm not... Wait, wait, wait. (laughs) Even Uno? Yes, which seems like Mormon heresy, right? Like, th- these are Mormons who are not allowed to play Uno? Yeah. What the f- I know. That is. But I'm not joking about outlawing fun. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he believed that fun is a sin. Of course, it's not surprising that there was also no internet access, no television, and decreased contact with the outside world. Okay, no surprises there. Except for the Uno thing. Except man, for that's... Uno. 
So in 2004, Warren Jeffs issued a list of 21 men he called master deceivers, who were also conveniently powerful men in the community who hadn't quite proved their loyalty to him in his new role as prophet. He ousted those 21 men from the church, reassigning their wives and children to other men. Wait, he can reassign children now, too? Yeah. Uh, I, s- I saw in the documentary, one woman had very young children when her husband was named as one of these 21 men and was kicked out of the church. She was told to burn all the pictures of her children with their biological father, refer to her new husband as their father, and never acknowledge that they had even had a different biological father. What? Yeah. C- so can this man sue for custody? With, I would think it would be difficult like, in the area where they live because the mayor of the town was part of the FLDS until he got kicked oh. out as one of those 21 men. The group was a lot larger than I would have thought. Exact numbers are hard to get because a lot of these people are not fully in, gover- in government systems. Um, but there were as many as 10,000 FLDS in the area. That's nuts. So, so and, and like they're yeah. all you know, they're people in local local government, local law enforcement. So uh, the the custody laws, right? Because the custody laws and the divorce laws are all going to be state level. So okay, or but it's going to be up to local law enforcement to enforce. Okay, right. Mm. And if let's say the man who was kicked out had three wives. Well, only one of them can be his legal wife in the United States, because whether you agree with it or not, bigamy is illegal. So if the kids were by, so let's let's say a man who's in that group that got kicked out had three wives. Well, one set of kids is by his legal wife, but two sets of kids are by his second wife and his third wife. So he's going to have to own up to committing a crime in order to sue for custody of the other two sets of children. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So, but he can't like ask for a DNA test. And also like half of them are in Utah and half of them are in Arizona. So it's like, they're just on the border. And so that's complicated. Right. And this is also a man who's just now finding out about the internet and has just been completely devastated and lost his entire life, family and everything at the hands of a cult. If he calls the local police, he's not going to get any help because the local police are either members of or friendly to the FLDS. <laughs> um, and how And how is he going until, well, locals started getting fed up with him eventually, but there are enough locals that are friendly that they can really clog up the paperwork. And how is he going to access information that says he has legal rights outside the local level? Like He does not know that you can just Google how to get my kids out of a cult. And the only book he's ever read is the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Right. Right. Uh, duh. I knew, like he doesn't even like he doesn't know anything. Yeah. And he was schooled. I'm, he went to school, quote unquote, on the FLDS premises. Yeah. So everything he knows you, has come from yeah. them. I keep like I've been doing the show so long. You think that I remember that people raised in a cult don't literally do not know how the world works outside of their cult framework. And this is like that times a, a thousand. Yeah. So the the other thing I was going to point out is also what is this guy going to do if he does try to get custody of his children? He's been shunned by his entire community. He has almost certainly lost his job, which was within the community. How so let's say he's got 16 kids. How is he going to sue for custody of 16 children? many of whom are too young to go to school. He's got nobody to watch them while he works. Also, how is he going to feed and clothe all of these kids when he has no education or job experience in the outside world? So he's got to go, what, get a job at McDonald's and then support 16 kids off of that with no childcare? It it doesn't logistically make sense. (laughs) This is nuts. This is... So speaking of taking people's children away, around this time, Warren Jeff started talking about a new place that he called Zion. It was a place only for the most pure and righteous FLDS followers. 
and it would be like the celestial kingdom on Earth. It was a place where the most faithful would survive the coming end of the world unscathed. So he started shipping off these most faithful followers, as well as many children, to this Zion place. Even many of the people whose children were being taken there, even many of Warren's own wives, didn't know exactly where Zion was. One of Warren's brother's wives, Charlene Jeffs, she was married at the time to Warren's brother, Lyle, got really curious about where Zion was. She wrote down the mileage on Lyle's truck one day before he went off to Zion, and then she wrote down the mileage when he got back. So she figured out how far away it was, and then she drew a circle on a map and then compared the color of the mud on his truck to locations on that circle on the map. And from that, she was able to figure out that it was somewhere in Texas. That's really smart. That's, Charlene wow. is is pretty cool. If you watch the documentary, um, she's a really fun character to listen to. That's that's interesting. No, uh, and, and they're so they're on like Utah Arizona border. Yeah, and he's taking the kids to Texas. Yeah, that's pretty far. That's like thousand miles, eight hundred miles, thousand miles. I'm not sure how far it was, but that sounds right. So the the problem is that whole families are getting called to Zion, but also children are just being taken. So women would just wake up one day and find out that their children had been taken from their beds in the middle of the night and they would freak out like somebody kidnapped my kids. And then they'd find out, oh, no, Warren Jeffs took them to Zion. And if you're good that, enough, maybe you can go there one day. That is terrifying. Yeah. Extremely. Uh, wow. Zion is also where all the people, all the children who were born through the forced breeding program were sent. The whole Zion thing, it's tied up in war and Jeff's like master race, obedient people kind of thing. Personally, I think Warren Jeffs looks like a giant mouse, so I don't trust his ideas of a master race. Yeah. If he's genetically perfect, then why does he need those thick ass glasses? Uh, That's the question. I don't think he's saying he's genetically perfect. I think oh. it's more he's spiritually perfect or something. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, the Nazis also thought that they were the master race. And have you seen what Hitler looks like? True. So as people got fed up with these people getting to go to Zion and the new rules and everything else and left the FLDS as people got kicked out, allegations against Warren Jeffs began to get more traction. There were lots and lots of reports about him, quote unquote, marrying underage girls as young as 12. So I remember hearing about this, like that this was going down on the news. I think I was in middle school and it was like a huge story. So there were allegations about him getting thrown around for years before people had anything actionable. After he kicked out those 21 men, some of them started bringing legal action against him and accusing him of child sexual assault, which was absolutely accurate. Jeff's building Zion was him trying to find a place to hide from law enforcement because the heat was getting turned up on him. They were building a massive temple there and housing enough for thousands of people. And the messaging was, when you're holy enough, you'll get called to go live in Zion and you'll get your kids back or you'll be reunited with your family members who have already gone. So these men that he's kicking out, they're they're the ones who are like who who are who are calling him out on this. Uh, yes. I feel like it's incredibly scummy to only make allegations against this guy after he kicks you out. You know what I'm saying? Like, because they, like they were all abusing these children and they only start bringing legal action against him after he cuts off their access to underage girls like that is <laughs> that. Yeah, that's fair. Mm. I don't. I would not be able to say if those men who got kicked out had married underage women like 16-year-olds, which, again, is wrong, but was generally accepted in there. You could say that they didn't know any better. Or if those men that got kicked out had also been marrying 14 and 12-year-olds, which I think anybody should know better, regardless of whether you're in a cult or not. Hold on. Let me Google something. The age of consent is 18 years old. Age of consent in Arizona is also 18 years old. Okay. Huh. I was just curious. Yeah. Um, um, age of consent for marriage in Texas is 14, which is another reason. Still? Uh, I don't know. I think it was at the time, but it might be still. Probably still is. It's Texas. 
Let me find this. A lot of states allow. Okay, so it's changed. It changed in 2017, it looks like. Um, Hold on. Okay, so it says that you can get married between the ages of 16 and 18 only with parental consent. Yeah, another law, another website that I'm looking at says 14 and older with parental consent. Wow, that's fucked. That's ooh. okay. That's a thing that Caleb Williams is absolutely right about. There are many states where underage marriage is legal. A lot of states, it's just one parent has to sign off. Really? Yeah. That's that. Yeah. St- all all this underage. That's all. It's all fucking icky, man. Wow. Yeah. That's. But as far so so talking about these these men who were kicked out of the FLDS and then started blowing the whistle on Warren Jeffs and his underage marriages. We, we, I don't know the ages of the women that those 21 men had married. So I don't know if, I don't know how scummy it is or mm. isn't. You know how there are people who have left the IFB and then they get a little bit better and then they kind of quit growing. Like they don't, they don't continue on to accepting LGBTQ people. They don't continue to the point of accepting women in church leadership and it's well props to you for getting out of a cult and being a little bit less misogynist and being a little bit less harmful but you wish that they had gone just a little bit further on that i can think of a few examples of that yes yeah that pattern shows up in the xl x flds quite a bit especially in men And this goes back, I think, to what we talked about with Eric a few months ago. It's harder for a person who was previously in power to deconstruct the systems that gave him power. Also, speaking intersectionally, this is the same reason that white women feminists often f*** while trying to be allies to women of color or other marginalized identities. Yeah, like they're trying to bring back the 90s when my struggle for rights was front and center and yours was the fringe one. But back to our story, Warren Jeffs was on the run between Short Creek and the Texas Zion location. He called that ranch in Texas the Yearning for Zion Ranch. There he married several girls as young as 12. You can see pictures of him with these girls, like wedding pictures of him with these girls on the internet. This really got to me. It just, it sunk in a lot more when I saw the pictures just how small and childlike they look next to him. It's very disturbing. There's a, there's a cache of them on the Smoking Gun website. Oh, what the f***? Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, f- this guy. Yeah. Um. Karate kick him in the throat with, like... I don't think, like, normal people have any concept of what that would look like. Oh, yikes. No, this guy's, like, two heads taller than, like... They're literally, this is literally a f***ing, like, a, a child. If you're looking at the one of him standing next to the girl in a purple dress, yeah, she's she's tiny next to him. She's not even, not even shoulder height on him. Her, her face is, her face is blurred. Yeah. But, like, she, uh, she is literally, this is literally somebody's child. Like, yeah. Not like somebody's child, like figuratively. This is somebody's literal child. What the? F- this is like sixth grade. Yeah, I don't. I don't think you have like like normal people don't have a concept of what a wedding picture of a twelve year old child would look like. I think in your head, th- this is not what you're thinking, and it's very disturbing. This is. So eventually, Warren Jeffs, uh, just more and more pressure from people who were trying to put him in jail. He was put on the FBI's ten most top 10 most wanted list. He was kind of living a nomad life all over the Southwest. He was supported while on the run by his church members who were bullied into giving more and more money to him. Mo- they gave money to the church and all of that money. They were told, oh, it's going to build the Yearning for Zion ranch. And what was actually happening is henchmen were hiding the money cash in cans of food before delivering it to Warren, who was on the lam on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Mm. And at the same time, the families remaining in Short Creek and the families in Texas had very little to eat because they were literally giving all of their money to support his lifestyle on the road. He spent time with underage, quote unquote, wives in Texas and other places. 
uh, as well as going to strip clubs, spending time in Vegas, and also going to Disneyland before finally being caught during a traffic stop. Wow. Yeah, man. This is like a regular R. Kelly out here. Mm. Yeah. No, like, I, I think this is interesting um, because up to this point, Warren Jeffs, I feel like, had a lot in common with David Koresh. But David Koresh actually made a stand and burned down his own compound and killed everybody, whereas uh, Warren Jeffs just like ran for it, hmm. went into hiding. I wonder just, if it would have been different if Jeffs had been apprehended at the compound instead of getting caught during a traffic stop. I wonder if there would have hmm. been some kind of standoff if that had happened. I, I, like, I have some thoughts about this. Maybe we'll come back to that later in the episode okay. at the end. Um, so Jeffs was arrested. He went to prison in Utah as accomplice to rape. That was the thing that they were able to get him on. Alyssa Wall, younger sister of Rebecca Wall, who was one of Rulon's wives, uh, Alyssa Wall had been married off to her cousin by Warren Jeffs. And she came back to Warren Jeffs and she said, this man that you married me off off to is sexually assaulting me. He's beating me. Uh, He's causing me all kinds of trouble. Can I not be married to him anymore? And Warren Jeffs told her to suck it up and deal with it, basically. Wow. So she is the person who became her own hero first on this case. Uh, Alyssa is absolute badass. She testified against him. And they were able to get him put away, I think, for 10 years for accomplice to murder or sorry, accomplice to rape in the state of Utah. But there were still hundreds of children at the compound in Texas. And Warren Jeffs was still deputizing people to perform underage marriages from jail. So finally, in 2008, CPS got a hoax phone call from a woman claiming to be a young girl who was married to an older man who was being abused on that compound in Texas. So when Texas CPS arrived, they found out that the call was a hoax. But while they were there, they found enough evidence to take over 400 children from the compound. So this is what I remember seeing on the news. I remember they like see they found 400 children in this compound in Texas. It was huge. It was everywhere. It was uh, like a giant story. Like there had been rumors flying around, oh, that these fundy Mormons are doing crazy stuff. But then like th- like when they actually found the compound with the 400 children and like the many of them like uh, like child brides with their own babies, that was like. Oh. Right. Well, and you have to remember that some of these yeah. children are the children who were taken away to Zion and their original parents back in. Utah and Arizona didn't know where they were. Yeah. So they had just been taken Mm. to Texas and raised by other people for potentially years at that point. So some of the parents had left the FLDS in Utah, but they didn't know where their children had been taken to. And because they were shunned by the FLDS, no one would tell them where they took their children. And they've all got like, and and like none of these kids have birth certificates either. I'm assuming so, they don't, or if they do have them, that they're locked up in Warren Jeff's office or in the temple that he built. So, and I don't know why they would have birth certificates because they all had their babies on the compound. So there are parents who had gotten out who are now finding out that's where my kids are. I've got to go get them. There are, like you said, very young women or girls with babies of their own. There are kids who don't know who their biological parents are. There is a whole mess when these 400 children are taken from the compound. And I don't think I was aware that Warren Jeffs had already been arrested by the time it happened. But this was big news because some FLDS women went on Larry King asking for their children back because Warren Jeffs really knows how to do PR. Question. When you were in the IFB, um, did, did you hear about this? Was this, a, was this something that you heard about? Was this something that they grabbed onto and said, see, this is why the Mormons are bad? Or did they leave it alone? I don't remember this one being a huge cultural touchstone. I'm pretty sure I was just aware of it from seeing it on the news or seeing magazines in the grocery store. I do think we had, I think we thought that all Mormons secretly practice polygamy, but also polygamy. I'm sure the eye <laughs> but also polygamy isn't um it isn't the top of the list for sins in the IFB. It's not something they condone. It's not something they practice, but the impression isn't 
that it's one of the big sins. The impression is that, well, this is something that God allowed people to do to repopulate the world after Noah's flood, and now it's not necessary because the world is populated enough. I mean, that's that's an interesting doctrinal interpretation and, and explanation. I don't know. Do you think that's why the IFB still rides with Kent Hovind? Or I don't think much of the IFB <laughs> still rides with Kent Hovind. I guess they've got that going for them. I think they've them. all gone, gone over to Ken Ham. So when Warren Jeffs went to trial, some truly disturbing information came out about the temple that he had his members build in Texas. I One more time, additional trigger warning on top of everything else. This is one place where I'm going to give a little bit of detail about Jeff's sexual assault of his underage brides. So what's typical in a Mormon temple is that there would be lots of white decorations, that there would be secret rooms and curtains and drapes that people are ritually brought through. What is absolutely not typical in a Mormon temple is that there would be a temple bed upstairs. That was all Warren Jeff's. He had had a ritual space custom constructed and built within the most holy space of the temple to rape his underage child brides. He would force some of his other wives to witness this act when he did it and even force them to participate by sexually touching him and each other during the act. And even worse, he made audio recordings of all of this. Because he is oh. sicko. What? The f- yeah. So d- did people know that he was doing like the, the, in the FLDS inside? Were, did people know that he was? Was this like common knowledge? I don't think so. From from what I read about this, only his wives and then anyone that they told would have been aware of the full extent of this. And of course, they were told not to tell anybody. Even members of his private security force have said that they didn't know the full extent of what was going on here. Did they say that they didn't know the full extent or did they or were they like So I read a, I read an interview with a guy who was on his private security force for years, like 30 or 40 years, and the member of his private security force heard a rumor that Warren Jeffs had married his niece, who was 12 years old at the time, and he didn't believe it or he thought, oh, this is he hasn't married her. He's just claimed her and then he's going to marry her in like two or three years when it's more acceptable. Uh, and then he found out that Warren had married and assaulted his 12 year old niece. And that's when he quit the security force, left the church. Done. Wow. So clearly he didn't know the extent of what this was going guy on. Did, this guy didn't know. But other people. But I guess, man, if if this guy had been on there for thirty four, he must have been hella loyal. He, he must have been seriously loyal. Yeah, and, but, and he was fine with prophets taking fourteen, fifteen year old wives. But when it was his twelve year old niece, suddenly this was different. And I don't think uh, it's helpful to look at this guy and and say, "Oh, well, he's a hypocrite because he, yeah," or "Oh, well, he's a hero because he stood up for." I don't find either one of those characterizations helpful. I think it's far more helpful to look at his story and say, "Wow, mind control can do some crazy things and make people accept things that they should damn well know better than to accept." And it's a good thing that he eventually got to the point where he couldn't accept it anymore. I don't like. I don't find yeah, it helpful to that. demonize or exonerate people like that. No. Still, that's. I mean, I'm. I'm just. I'm just wondering how much everybody knew. I mean, other people. Because imagine being like, "Hey, I'm. You're Warren, and you're going to one of your underlings, and you're like, "Hey, I need a uh, audio recording and like, uh, uh, you know, some microphone set up in the temple sex room." <laughs> Whatever the f*** he, in, in his, like... Well, he had his own craftsman custom build him a temple bed. He had very specific specifications yeah. for it. But, but, like, so somebody had, like, they had to build it. Somebody had to build it. And, they, like, were they going to say, huh, what are these microphones for, Warren? Oh, they're for me dictating prophecies. That's probably what he said, not for... Right, and I people even, people like, would know that he was sexually assaulting these very young brides that he took. What they didn't know about was the he what they didn't know was that he was forcing other wives to watch him do it and also forcing them into group sex with each other, which would have been 
think about it from the standpoint of somebody in this group, that would have been far more scandalous. Right, because that's homosexuality, which is right, always Because a sin- taking okay. underage brides is something that they do. Any kind of same sex or same gender sexual behavior is not something that they do. That's f- like, man, wow. Hypocrisy on display right there. Oh, Okay, we we gotta we gotta move on. I gotta, but like, what what if what if somebody else? Because this there's like sixty people. He's married. To, he's married to sixty people. That's a big Warren circle Jeffs. I people. think he had closer to eighty wives toward the end. So, so he's got eighty wives, and like, if somebody lets it slip, what's like he's not gonna know who said what to who because there's so many of them that know what's going on. Okay, here's That's, let's talk about this scenario. If one of the wives lets it slip to another young woman, let's say one of her friends who isn't married yet, that young woman is going to think that this is just what marriage is. Jeff's referred to these rapes as, quote, heavenly sessions. He told the girls that they were bringing Mm. him and themselves closer to God. He told them, like, this is a thing that the prophet does to get close to God. Once again, calling back to Jack Scott. So if they did tell someone, remember, they have no terminology for what's being done to them, for parts of their body, for parts of other people's bodies, etc. They have no terminology other than what Jeff's gives them. So the other person would just think, so if she tells another young girl who's 13, 14, 15 and has no idea about anything, that other girl is just going to think, this is what the wife of the prophet does. This is what a heavenly session with the prophet is. If she tells someone who is already married, they also might just think that this is normal for the prophet, like just a privilege that the prophet has. After all, he talks to God and he has claimed to be God incarnate on earth. So if he's saying that this is okay, it's got to be okay, right? So if this young girl tells someone who is not fully brainwashed and does know better, then maybe she has a chance that she actually gets help. Is the person that she told a true believer who's going to mention something to Jeff's in private and tell on the girl who told him and get her in trouble and also get an answer from Jeff's that's going to placate them? Or is the girl who wants to tell on him going to get really lucky and manage to find some adult that isn't fully brainwashed who is a safer person and will actually try to do something to help her? That's right, because they don't even know what sex is, or they, they don't even, or when they get married, they don't even know what the thing that they're supposed to do is. I don't know, like they don't even know that other couples do it right. Oh, this is. Hmm. Yeah, there is no recourse within they just a think group. This is what the prophet does. Yeah, like they, they don't no know <laughs> head from tails. <laughs> you know, they have no idea. There's no recourse in a group that is under this kind of mental control. Of course, there's also the factor that Jeffs has told them that anything less than perfect obedience will send them straight to hell. There's also the very real fact that if they get excommunicated over, and this is the guy who has excommunicated a kid over wearing short sleeve shirts and having a girlfriend. (laughs) So if they get excommunicated, not only are they going to hell, but they will never get to speak to their family ever again. There's also the unfortunate truth That outside of his illegal, immoral, and disgusting marriages, Warren Jeffs was also a serial child predator who molested multiple children, including some of his own relatives. And he used that same disgusting line about this is bringing you closer to God. And he told them that if they told anyone, they would go to hell. So FBI... CPS, they they get a hold of this evidence. They get a hold of these recordings. What happens next? Uh, Warren Jeffs went to jail for a life life sentence. Um, I should mention, so legal stuff, the first sentence for accomplice to rape in Utah originally got overturned, but before they let him out of jail, they extradited him to Texas for the the actual rape trial, and that's when he got sentenced to life plus 20 years. So did he plead out or did he go to trial? He went to trial. His defense strategy was freedom of religion, and it obviously did not go very well. I cannot imagine that the people of Texas would look kindly on a serial child rapist uh, trying to hide behind religion to do so. Well, the jury was played the audio recording of him assaulting a 12-year-old, and they deliberated for 30 minutes. 
jury was not having it that day. Yeah, good for them. This man is never getting out. He is never getting out. Unfortunately, he is still allegedly running the FLDS from behind bars. From what I can tell, they're what? losing members quickly, tons of people leaving, but the ultra faithful are still hanging on for some reason. How is this allowed? Like I what like with with phone calls through letters? Phone through calls email? and letters, like, yeah. Can't they t- like, they can't take down the whole of the FLDS with like Rico or something? Because like th- this is like a whole cult that's built around raping children. It's that's like their whole dealio. Well, they, they're committing financial fraud too. I can tell you about that. <laughs> oh my god, that t- oh. so pales in comparison to. So before before I tell you that, um, just to kind of keep my topics together, um, apparently Jeff's is still attempting to run the FLDS. As far as an organization from behind bars, he is also apparently directing groups of his wives to have sex with each other over the phone for his entertainment while he is in jail. Just so you know. On one of these calls, he gave a very relevant quote. Uh, I want this is I want to give you a it's four words. You can make it through. This is Warren Jeff's idea of sexy talk. And I feel like this is the best way to gross you out without making you listen to an audio of him actually assaulting somebody because I am not going to play that on my show. His idea of sexy talk on one of these calls, he said to the women, you are affecting me. Mm. I'm sorry. I'm just, if I had to read it, you have to hear it. Affecting me. You are affecting me. You are bringing me comfort. That's, that's like what his sexy talk sounds like. And it's extremely so gross. That is, I, that's not even gross. That's like a, a, a that, that that's that's like something that you would get in the porn magazine that you get that you find at the sperm bank. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't know, but okay. If if you think that sexy talk, you probably get turned on by anatomy diagrams in your textbook. I don't know. That's well, like, they take anatomy uh, diagrams out of IFB textbooks for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So okay, so so I did the the. You are affecting me. You God, affecting that's me. like, and he, it, it's uh, it's gross. I'm not going to describe that any further because I feel like I'm coming out of my own skin. I want to go back to even... back to like the fraud and Rico stuff. This is this confusing. Easier. So there have been multiple lawsuits and criminal action taken against FLDS leaders. Some have been arrested and convicted. It turns out that what they do is if they have second, third, fourth, so on and so on, wives, those wives are not legally married to their husbands. So legally, they are single mothers without jobs, so they can collect food stamps. The leaders will then have them spend their food stamps at FLDS-owned stores and not actually give them the food. So it's like a ghost purchase, and then it becomes a money laundering scheme. Wow. That's how the church gets the money for the food stamps. And any other welfare that they receive gets given to the husband who then gives it to the church. So it's welfare welfare fraud. Um, That's genius. Yeah. And it's it's so much nicer than the other crimes. (laughs) So much rather talk about this. So Lyle Jeffs, Warren's brother, was sentenced to fin- was sentenced to 57 months for this in 2017. He just recently got released in May of 2021. The thing about why can't they put more of these people away for sexual assault is that the government has to know about a crime to charge a particular person with that crime. The government can't just bring all the men in and take a census of their wives and find out how old they are because... The young women in question and the girls in question have been completely, and I mean completely, brainwashed and controlled their entire lives. Part of that control has been that they've been prepared to be married off at a very young age, and they've been told, if any law enforcement ever questions you, don't answer anything you don't absolutely have to answer and tell them that you're 18. And all the other women who are other wives of the same guy are going to agree. Yes, she's 18, or she's 18 plus whatever the age of her youngest child is. These girls may not even know who their biological parents are to begin with, because children get taken and shuffled around and given to other parents all the time. They may not have a legal birth birth certificate, or they may not have access to it, or they may not know where it is. So the girls aren't going to self-report because they don't know that they can, 
They don't have access to any internet resources that would let them know that what is going on to them is actually abuse. No one else from the community is going to report for the same reasons. And there's really just no way to find out how many crimes are being committed. So these sexual assaults are probably still going on in these communities, but this is part of why it's so hard to catch because they're so isolated. Somebody has to report for there to be an investigation for somebody to get caught and go to jail. It sounds like such a mess. God. It is. Wow. It is. It's, it's an absolute mess. I already said this part. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I want to move on to, to, uh, to talk about something else. Cause earlier this year we talked about David Koresh and we talked about the branch Davidians. Um, and I think that, that, I think that was our first episode of 2022. Um, obviously there's a lot of similarities here with, uh, Warren Jeffs, uh, also with uh, Rulon, his father, um, you know, the declaration of being a prophet, multiple child brides, the compound in Texas, that whole thing. These are all major similarities, but there's also major differences here. And I think it's important that we talk about like maybe w- like why those differences are. I, I kind of want to get your thoughts on this. OK. Um, yeah. So. I personally think that the difference between David Koresh and Warren Jeffs is the difference between, you know, the difference between wealth you worked for and wealth you inherited. You know what I'm saying? Like it's the difference between being a grifter and being like a true believer. Like if you're promised something from your father and then you get like, you feel entitled to it. But if you work for something, then you're not going to let go of it. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah. I think, I think I'm starting to get it, but go on. Yeah. Cause so David Koresh turns the Branch Davidians from being like a weird sect, uh, like an offshoot, into being just a full-on militarized apocalyptic death cult. And yes, there had been a prophet before who practiced like as the leader of the Davidians, but he was the one who like built this thing up, was recruiting the outsiders to come in, uh, you know, was like, okay, our compound is going to, you know, we're going to have all these guns on the compound. We're going to be prepared for being invaded. Um, and he was the one that really, you know, had the, the, what was it? The new, uh, the new light where he's like, all your wives are mm-hmm. belong to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Warren Jeffs, on the other hand, he's raised in the FLDS and he's the son of the prophet he didn't build it. He just seized power in the power vacuum and his prophecies, his divine directives. They're specifically to like, just very transparently to his own benefit. And so he's like reactionary rather than being visionary. And his followers are there because, you know, that's how they were raised and they have no other choice. Whereas like people are joining the Davidians from outside because they hear, Oh, there's this interesting, crazy guy who says he's a prophet in Texas and they come and see him. And he's so charismatic that they're like, this guy's the guy. Um, But Mm. these FLDS people, they're like, they're just born into it. They have no other choice and they only know how to obey him. So he can like point the focus towards living as a despot. than like dying as a martyr like David Koresh would have done. And this is why I think you see David Koresh dig in and and fight like and have the standoff with the FBI and the ATF as opposed to Warren Jeffs, who's just like, oh, they're coming for me. There's a warrant for me. I'm just going to run away. And the government starts sniffing around his secret compound full of child brides. And he's like, nope, I'm just going to go on the road and I'm just going to have people deliver me money and live the good life. Well, it's it's also an arrogance thing because Warren Jeffs somehow thought that he could evade law enforcement on the run, not even hunkered down somewhere while he was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Yeah. He's extremely arrogant. That is one thing that is very apparent to me. Jeffs once said, the kingdom of God is a benevolent dictatorship. And I think that sums up his view of leadership really well. I agree with your characterization of him as much more of a coward than Koresh. Koresh was more a wild, bombastic kind of evil. I think Jeff's is much more of a just disgusting and pitiful kind of evil. You know, I think it's funny what you said about the benevolent dictatorship, because it seems like in my observation, I don't know if yours have been the same, is that people who believe in a dictatorship are always the same people who think that they would be the ideal dictator. You know what I'm saying? True. Like, 
the, the dictator should be in charge. Who should the dictator be? Me. In this mm. case, the person who thinks they're the ideal dictator is spineless and cowardly and will use other people and seek their own benefit first. But he won't. I, I don't know. He just seems to have no gumption to me. He makes bold moves like kicking the 21 men out of the church. But he refused to do that without an armed security guard standing behind a curtain on stage because he thought that the crowd was going to mob him. He has all this power, but he's not even secure in his own power. His messages and revelations from prison are just pompous, self-righteous. And of course, they're about how his people have to continue to support him with money and phone sex. I, I almost think that Warren Jeffs controls people just because he likes to feel important. You know, maybe I've just been reading a lot of fantasy novels lately. Um, but like this is really a trope that the reluctant leader is always the best leader and that the person who believes that the, the crown or the leadership is theirs by right or by birth or they think they would be the best at it. And so they seek to take it by force. They're never the people who are the best suited to you know possess that that leadership or that that crown or whatever it's like this is a very 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 common trope in fantasy novels and um i think to a certain extent it is true in the real world but uh this is an example of that i think so my final thoughts on this are that the story itself here is salacious it's interesting and it's a great rabbit hole but that's not what made me want to bump our planned episode and do this one instead. I think what caught my attention so strongly about this one is what a great example of cult control it is. Yeah, celestial marriage and plural marriage and child brides, it's all very attention-grabbing. But in the FLDS, we see a level of control that most cults don't achieve. There's a unique cognitive dissonance here. When Jeff's and his United Order get special food, rich food and the people that he leads are suffering and starving. When Jeffs himself admitted that the quote unquote heavenly sessions with his wives broke all the rules, when he has at different times renounced his position at profit as profit because of sins he's committed. And then he took the position of profit back. And he said that his brother Lyle was no longer the prophet and no longer was a priesthood holder. It, It seems obvious to me that this kind of control only happens when Everyone is living together and doesn't have to interact with the outside world much, if at all. I have a lot of respect for the people who have broken free of the FLDS and have, especially those who have chosen to spoke to speak about it publicly. I have to think it would be a lot harder to break out for an FLDS person than it would be for someone who is IFB, just because the way of life is even farther removed from the world outside. I I just hope that the dozens or hundreds of people who have left will somehow be able to show the people who do remain that there is a good life outside. And I hope that Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey gets a second season. Yeah, man. I mean, it was hard enough for you to transition to life outside the IFB. I can't imagine how impossible it must feel to transition to life outside of the FLDS. It's just a different level. Wow. Well, cool. Uh, if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show you can and you want to discuss this episode, you can join our Facebook group and our subreddit. Both of those are called Eden Exodus. Good places to have that conversation. You can join our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast, where you have extended and uncensored versions of our episodes. I think today's episode is quite a, a, a decent amount of Patreon content on that one. Um, and if you want to follow the podcast, you can follow us on social media on Facebook and Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast, on Twitter at Leaving Eden Pod. Sadie, do you want to plug your social media? Sure. You can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music, on Twitter at Hell Yes Sadie, or on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at G A V R I E L H A C O H E N. Thank you so much for listening. You guys have a good day. Bye bye. But oh, oh.